to the Revelation story. This is lesson eight of 55. I'd like you to introduce Art Pierce. He's the one that's going to be lecturing today. Yes, you are. Okay. Thank you, David. God bless, sir. All these lessons are available in book form. If you just go to Amazon.com and type in 50 years of notes on the Revelation, and you will see this book available. If you wish to write to us, you can see we do have a post office box right here in Santa Rosa Beach, Florida. And of course, what we're doing now, because of the virus problem, we're filming this right in my apartment living room, so that's our situation now. And we want to start with a word of prayer. So Lord Jesus, how we praise you and thank you once again for this opportunity. And we pray as this lesson goes out over the internet, on the YouTube, that you will bless it and that it will be fruitful, that many people can grow in their Christian experience and even find our Lord Jesus as their savior because of these videos. So fill us with your Holy Spirit Speak through us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I have often joked about calling our sessions Destiny Seminary because many of the things that I have been teaching are on seminary level, and we're going to have more today. So, it will be a challenge to you, but I'm sure that you're going to be able to handle it. As we start tonight, I would like to share a scripture verse or two with you. This verse is, of course, Paul's writing to the Romans, chapter 1. And Paul writes, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. As you note on the verse on the screen, that I want to call your attention to those words, set apart. Paul is about to teach to the Romans that a Christian person is different than other people of the world. We are separate from the people of the world. Now, what that means is that we should be different. Here are a couple of more good verses. In the Gospel of John, chapter 15, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. And this is, of course, Jesus speaking. As you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. The world accepts things, of course, like cursing, same-sex marriage, smoking, marijuana, etc., on down the line. The Christian does not accept these things because we are different. When we are teaching our kids rather than trying to come up with a long list of arguments against these things, the simple explanation for the Christian is that's just not us. It is not that we're better than anyone else, which of course we're not, but we just see things differently than the people of the world. Of course, the best lesson of all is just our personal example. For years, I have had this picture on my bathroom mirror. And notice that it says, Dad, let your heart follow your heavenly fathers because there's a little heart following yours. And that's a great lesson because it's the personal example. We can't talk to our children about avoiding cigarettes when we're smoking. So the personal example is best. Another interesting verse, we, which uh, we're back to referring to Romans verse, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an, an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The Greek words here used for set apart is where we get our word for a horizon. 
when you're traveling or driving down the road, we always have a horizon as we look out across our scenes. As a Christian, a horizon is different than people of the world. And that's what we're saying. We see things differently. Paul is really saying by being separate from the world, our spiritual horizon should be getting larger and larger. It's a lot like taking off in an airplane. Going down the runway, all we can see perhaps is the control tower and different parts of the airport. But as we gain altitude, our horizon gets larger and larger until we can see the entire city. The higher we go, the more of this world we can see or get to see. We start to see things differently. And I believe that is what you dear people are doing by watching these videos on YouTube. We're not satisfied just seeing the spiritual airport. We're desiring to see a lot more. And you are here to be enlarging, in other words, your spiritual horizon. That's what we are doing together. So by studying the Revelation, a Christian is able to get to some pretty high spiritual altitudes. Often during our study, it's required to go off in some short tangents because along the way, we will mention some topics that are not preached. Well, we're at a spot like that tonight. Let's broaden our spiritual horizon. The Revelation chapter 2 verse 12 tells us these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. We noted last week that the sword has two edges. And often I'm asked the question, why two edges? And of course, the simple answer is because the sword representing God's word represents Old and New Testament both. One edge can judge, you see, those who lived under the dispensation of law. That's the Old Testament. One edge can judge those who live and are now living under the dispensation of grace, the New Testament. Question. Just one of the latter viewers now we're on page 66 of the book. In my book, it's page 66. Thank you, David. <laughs> okay, so here we go with expanding our spiritual horizon. We have a little bit of a tricky word here, don't we? Dispensation. What is a dispensation? Again, I do not think it is preached. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 2. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. Now, the word administration in this verse is really our word dispensation. Paul is speaking here of a dispensation of grace. And what Paul is saying is that Christians are now living under a different dispensation than the people of the Old Testament. The New Testament times, or our church age, is a different dispensation. What is a dispensation? All right. By definition, it is a period of time. Do not make that word dispensation hard or tricky in your mind. It's simple. It is simply a period of time. It is a period of time during which human beings are tested with respect to obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God. So God's will reveals something to us and a dispensation is a period of time when we're tested as to whether we're going to obey and have respect for God's will, you see, or whether we're going to reject it. So that's simple definition of dispensation. It's simply a period of time. Today we're not told to build an ark. We live during a different period of time, in other words. Adam and Eve ran around naked. <laughs> we don't walk around naked, you see, because we are living during a different period of time. 
we're living during a different dispensation. All right, let's learn four ideas about dispensations. First, each one represents a divine ordering of the affairs of the world. Second, during each of these time periods, God deals differently with human beings. Although, of course, himself, he does not change. Human beings have failed or will fail in every one of them. So in every one of these periods of time, throughout the history of this world, human beings have failed or will fail in the future. And of course, what this does, it brings God's judgment in every case. The fourth idea, each dispensation ends with an easily recognized break in time. And we will see that as we go through them. I wonder how many dispensations are there? How many different periods of time have human beings been living through throughout uh, church history and all the history of the world, even including Old Testament? Well, the answer is seven, of course. That comes as no surprise, all right? There are seven dispensations or periods of time in Scripture. Let's look at each one really quick and then we'll do them more in detail. First, the age of innocence. Human beings were created perfect and pure and they lived in a perfect environment. You may wonder how long that lasted. <laughs> I've often wondered that myself. Well, it was probably short-lived. Second is the age of conscience. Everyone now is going to govern themselves. Just let conscience be your guide, you see. Well, again, it didn't last very long, I'm sure. We come to the age of human or civil government. A leader governed each group or each language clan, let's say. Dispensation number four is the age of promise. And this, of course, is the birth of the nation of Israel. Now the family patriarch is sort of the ruler. God now wrote down his laws or his rules to live by. Now we had them written down, you see. And then we come to the age of grace, which we're living in today, of course. People are governed by free will. We can decide on our own whether to obey or not to obey. We can decide on our own whether to accept Christ as our Savior or to reject Him. This is the age of grace, free will. And then the last one, number seven, is yet future. The age of the kingdom. And we call this the millennium. People are forced by Jesus personally on how to live. And that will last for 1,000 years. All right. With each dispensation or period of time, we are going to see four things. We're going to see its initiation, when it all started. We will then see the conditions because in each time period, the conditions under which human beings are living or being tested is different. And of course, then number three, we will see the result. And then we get to the end of each time period. The seven dispensations in scripture. First, the age of innocence. This was before the fall. Adam and Eve were living in the Garden of Eden. The initiation, man was created totally innocent. And then Eve later joined up with the man. They lived in the Garden of Eden, Eden totally innocent. The conditions, man is placed in a perfect environment, the Garden of Eden. It must have been really nice, I'm sure. Adam and Eve, human beings, 
try to live in direct fellowship with God. The scriptures say they walked with God each day. <clears throat> direct fellowship with God. Adam and Eve were subjected to an absolute simple test. Don't eat of one tree. And I understand most people write about this tree. It was probably the most beautiful tree that perhaps a human person has ever seen. And it was planted right in the middle of the garden. Adam and Eve probably passed it every day. I guess it's a similar idea like if you go to Disney World, Animal Kingdom, I think there's a tree. And you can see it almost from any spot in that park. Now, of course, it's only plastic. <laughs> but the point is, it's big and looks really good, and you can see it from almost anywhere in the park. And I'm sure that's the way it was with the Garden of Eden. Probably very tempting, you see. But God's law was, do not eat of this tree. Eve later on added that they were not even to touch it. That's what she said. I don't know if God said that. But she said that, and she added that on later. So, they were warned of the consequences. If you eat this tree, you're going to die. All right. I've often wondered, if we were in that position, how long could we last? Probably not very long. The result. It ended when sin entered the world with Adam and Eve. They had deliberately and utterly failed. They did what God said they should not do. And they did eat of the tree. Adam and Eve disobeyed. And the end, of course, the dispensation or period of time of innocence is going to end. And the judgment was they were kicked out of the garden, weren't they? Notice it's a very clear, definite end to that period of time or dispensation. Kicked out of the garden. The second dispensation then proceeds after that point, And this is the age of conscience. And the idea is human beings think, well, we can live by our own conscience. We know what's right or wrong, you see. So this age or period of time goes from the fall of Adam and Eve all the way up to Noah. If we could just follow our conscience, that could be our guide. We would be okay, wouldn't we? Well, no way it didn't work, as you might expect. Initiation. Man is clothed in a garment made by God. And this is an interesting uh, idea here. The divinely made garment is necessary and it is a picture of our Lord Jesus. It was a picture of Christ all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. We are covered not with something we made ourselves because remember Adam and Eve tried to make something out of fig leaves. Didn't work, did it? It has to be a divine covering and that's the whole point, you see. Just like Jesus on our cross, on the cross, was a divine covering for our sin. We couldn't cover it ourselves. It's hopeless for a human being to try, you see. Cover with a divine righteousness to make us fit to be in God's presence. The sin of the people are now covered with an innocent animal shedding its blood. And of course, Jesus was innocent. Shedding his blood covers our sin today. What a blessing. Conditions for the age of conscience. Because man sinned and ate the forbidden fruit, they now have the knowledge of good and evil. And supposedly now, humans have the ability to tell the difference. The good and evil is the obedience or disobedience to what we know of the will of God. We can choose. Conscience, our conscience has now been awakened. 
You see, we can choose to obey or not to obey as God's will is revealed to us. Expelled from the garden, man is now responsible on his own, you see, to exercise this conscience to all the good and to abstain from all known evil. In a sense, people try to live under, let's say, personal self-government. Everyone had to take care of themselves. Well, we know the kind of results, don't we? Man could not handle this responsibility. Human beings just can't do it. And again, they utterly failed. The end, the dispensation of conscience ended with the judgment of the flood of Noah. A definite break, you see, in this period of time or dispensation. Once again, people had disobeyed. We then moved into another period of time called the age of human or civil government. And now we're going to go from Noah all the way up to Abraham. Let's just follow and allow the government to take care of us. <laughs> the government could do a good job, right, of taking care of us. Well, the government can tell us what's right or wrong. Well, bad news. It's like our government in Washington today thinks they can tell us what to do or how to live. But you see, the government in Washington has a problem because they have no biblical basis. So ultimately, it's not going to work, is it? The initiation with the declaration of what we call the Noetic Covenant Humans are now subjected to a new test, man governed by its leaders. It's a change, isn't it, in how human beings are directed, let's say. Well, I mentioned the Noetic Covenant. We might as well put it up here. The Noetic Covenant in Scripture, it has seven parts. God will never again curse the earth as he did with the flood. And of course, we all know that God made that promise with Noah afterwards, after the flood. Second thing, Noah and his family will replenish the earth with people. There were eight survivors because the ark, Noah, three sons, and all the wives, and they were to replenish the earth with people. Third, they shall have dominion over the animal creation. And for the first time ever, they are now allowed to eat meat. The law of capital punishment was established with a noetic covenant. They never will be, there never will be, again, a worldwide flood. And the sign of God's promise will be the rainbow. And many times we see rainbows in our sky and according to the scriptures, it's to remind us of God's promise. Never again will the earth be subjected to something like a flood. All right? The conditions of this dispensation. Man must now govern the world for God. The patriarch or head of the household is the ruler. The responsibility is now for the entire clan and is no longer on an individual basis, let's say. And of course, the results of this, man couldn't handle this responsibility. Every time we see the same thing, don't we? It doesn't matter what kind of conditions we're living under, we just can't handle it. And once again, human beings utterly failed. The end of this dispensation of human government came with the judgment of the confusion of tongues. People couldn't handle living this way, and God refused all the tongues, or confused all of the tongues of the world at the Tower of Babel. The people had disobeyed. Well, we move into a fourth period of time 
a fourth dispensation. And this one is called the Age of Promise. And it has to do with the establishment of the nation of Israel. Now, we're up to Abraham. And this dispensation or period of time goes from Abraham all the way up to Moses. The initiation. With the institution of God's covenant, Abraham and his descendants become the heirs of promise. Now everything's through Abraham. God will set up his own nation, Israel. And the purpose of Israel is to be a guide to the world about how we should behave and conduct ourselves. That's part of why they're said to be the chosen people. They were chosen to be an example to the world of how human beings are supposed to live. Well, surely this will work, right? <laughs> no way, you see. Conditions. The Abrahamic covenant is unconditional. The blessings of the covenant, however, require Israel to dwell in the land. All right. Results. Israel could not handle their responsibility. And again, human beings and the nation of Israel itself utterly failed. And we can't expect anything else, can we? With each one, it's the same. The end. The blessings of the dispensation of promise ended with the judgment of Israel being driven into bondage and slavery in Egypt. A very definite ending to a period of time or a way of living. So even this did not work, you see. Israel failed and ended up in bondage in Egypt. The people of Israel had disobeyed, as all of the people in the world, I'm sure. All right, I mentioned the Abrahamic covenant. We might want to compare that with the Noetic covenant. It consists of seven unconditional promises from God. From Abraham would come a great nation that God would bless with natural and spiritual prosperity. Second, God would make Abraham's name great and through him bring about a great nation. Third, God would bless those who blessed Abraham's descendants and cursed those that cursed them. I've said this before, I say it again. These countries that are messing it with Israel have no idea what they're messing with. Ultimately, they're going to be put down in some way, I'm sure. The fourth idea here, in Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And they will be a blessing in return then to many others. This is fulfilled in Jesus, of course, and his work of salvation. Fifth, the sign of this covenant was the idea of circumcision. And then, sixth, God promised a land for their country. Finally, idea number seven. This covenant, which was repeated to Isaac and Jacob, confined, was confined to the Hebrew people and the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, during this period of time, this dispensation, I wondered, did the people obey or did they disobey? People disobeyed, could not live under these conditions of promise. <laughs> And they were driven into slavery in Egypt, weren't they? Well, dispensation number five, the age of law. And here we go from Moses to Christ. After the Egyptian bondage Israel, uh, uh, of Israel in, in Egypt, they were freed and God gave his laws to the people then, didn't he? The Ten Commandments, and this was through Moses on Mount Sinai. Now it's written down how people should live and what they should obey. Oh, I didn't do the initiation. 
the initiation after the Egyptian bondage of Israel, God gave his Ten Commandments through Moses on Mount Sinai, and this is the guide then of how people should live. So, the conditions then of this period of time, how we should live, Israel was to live under God's laws. And it's now written down. Surely this would work. We have it in writing how we should live. Well, we know the results, don't we? Israel could not handle the responsibility. And again, they utterly failed. We today have failed. As a matter of fact, today, it's even against the law to display the Ten Commandments in public. Many places have laws. You, you just can't do that. Well, we're just as guilty as Israel was back then. The end, we see, the dispensation or period of time of law ended with the judgment of the cross. Human beings as a whole refused to allow God to tell them how they should live. Israel crucified then their rightful king, which of course was Jesus, their ruler of Jesus. The crucifixion of Jesus fulfilled all the elements of the law. Jesus paid the penalty for every one of our, us human beings. We have all failed to keep the law, and it's only through Jesus that we can come into fellowship again with God. So, the plea is always going out to everyone. You hear my voice, the plea is going to you. Learn to love Jesus. Make sure you have him in your heart because we're all going to utterly fail no matter what condition we're under for our, uh, our lives. We're all fail and we need Jesus then to forgive us. And it's his death on the cross, shedding of his blood that covers our sin and makes us then acceptable to God. And it's a free gift. All we have to do is just believe it. Well, the people disobeyed. They could not live under God's written down laws. Age number six, the age of grace. Well, that's what we're living under today, isn't it? And the age of grace is going to go from the crucifixion of Christ all the way up to the second advent because he's coming back again, isn't he? So we're living today in this period of time, the age of grace. The initiation, the dispensation began with the resurrection of Jesus and the arrival of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. That is often called the birthday of the church. All right? And it is, we could say, the birthday of this dispensation. This period of time began at that point, this idea of living under grace. Conditions? The point of testing is no longer legal obedience or disobedience, but now it's simply acceptance or rejection of Jesus Christ. We either have him as our savior or we reject him. We have that choice under this dispensation, don't we? People are trying to live under God's gift of free will, his grace, his unmerited favor, and his undying love. We're now free from the law. We may now allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. Good works are now just the fruit of our salvation. They're not the salvation or evidence of the salvation itself. It is not the salvation itself. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Notice it doesn't depend upon anything that we do other than belief on our part. It is the gift of God. When someone gives you a gift, you didn't have to work for it. It's coming free to you. It's a gift, and salvation is free from God to us. All we have to do is believe and accept Jesus. Notice, not by works, so that no one can boast. 
If we got there by works, could you imagine what eternity is like? Boy, look at me. I got here because I had that hospital built, right? Or I got here because I attended church every week. No, 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 no. That's not it. We still come up short of the glory of God. We need Jesus. And it's the cross that gets us there, you see. All right. Well, we're still living today under the age of grace or dispensation of grace. What are the results going to be? <laughs> well, is it going to be any different? <laughs> you see, it doesn't matter what conditions we live under. We all fail, don't we? We can't handle this age of grace. This responsibility is just too much for us. We can't handle it. And once again, we're going to utterly fail, aren't we? What's the end? The dispensation of grace will end with the rapture of the church. The believers, all of a sudden, are going to disappear. We're going to be out of here. And then what happens? Direct judgments upon the people of the earth during the great tribulation and the second advent, Jesus returning to this earth. Human beings continue to disobey and to refuse to accept Jesus as their Savior today. Human beings around the world have refused, you see, and the church is soon going to be raptured. And I think we're getting close to that point. So, this is where we are today. It is near time for the rapture of the church. And it will then be time for Satan to bring forth his man the rider of the white horse, and we have that lesson coming up. Satan's lie of a kingdom will only last for seven years, and then will come dispensation number seven. We are now free from the law. We may now allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us, and human beings around the world who have refused, and once the church is raptured, they're going to be judged. So that's where we are today. In the future, after the rapture of the church, comes the kingdom age, or what we call the millennium. The initiation. The kingdom will begin with the physical return of Jesus to this earth. I believe it's coming. I believe we're close. Jesus once rode into Jerusalem in humility. The next time, he's going to ride into Jerusalem with judgment and power. I often say no one's going to slap him in the face this time. He's coming back in power and not in humility as he did before. All right? The conditions. Mankind throughout all the earth will live under the direct rule of Christ. Jesus will rule from the throne in the temple in Jerusalem. It's not built yet. <laughs> there is no temple in Jerusalem today. But the Bible teaches it will be rebuilt. And when Jesus returns, he's going to sit in that temple. Jesus will rule from the throne in that temple in Jerusalem. All members of the church, which the scriptures call his bride will be with him here. We're coming back with Jesus. Surely with Jesus ruling directly on the earth and Satan bound in chains and not allowing any sin, humans are going to be able to handle that, right? <laughs> Satan is going to be bound for 1,000 years. Humans are going to live under a forced obedience to the will of God. Are human beings going to like that? Notice it's a forced obedience. Wow. Well, I think we can predict the results. <laughs> Man can't handle this responsibility. And <laughs> it's going to utterly fail, isn't it? We're going to fail after 1,000 years of direct by, reign by Jesus on this earth. Well, the dispensation, the kingdom is going to end with a world war. 
And this is the final battle that this earth will ever see. Because Satan is going to be released and the people of the world are going to flock to him. Wow. This is the only uh, time when human beings will be able to then make their choice because they're going to be forced to live under the direct rule of Jesus during that 1,000 years. But at the end, they're going to have the same choice that we have today, either accept Jesus or reject him. And of course, the dispensation is going to end with world war. Satan being released, the people are going to flock to him. The outcome of this battle will be the destruction of the earth as we know it. And then we're going to be at what's called the judgment of the great white throne, which is final judgment before eternity. Next week, our next lesson, we're going to pick up the seven churches again, and we're going to go to Pergamum, the church that becomes married to Rome, elevated to a position of acceptance by the state. Any comments or questions from anyone at this point? We're going to close in prayer. So, Lord Jesus, we praise you and thank you once again for these ideas. This lesson on dispensation, I think, is important because we see we human beings fail every time. We need your forgiveness. We need to pray, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me for having failed so often in whatever situation we're in. We need Jesus in our hearts. Bless those people who are watching this video today in a special way. And might this video have fruit. We pray this in the name of Jesus and to give him all the honor and glory. Amen.